Welcome to Holy Post episode 477. Friend of the show, Derwin Gray, has a new book. When did he have time to write it? We don't know. But he also found time to sit down with Sky and talk about it. Derwin says the Lord's Prayer isn't just a prayer, but an entire catechism of faith, a lesson in communing with God, and a call for the people of God to engage in issues of justice. He unpacks it all with Sky. And did scientists find the biblical city of Sodom? Have psychologists found the number one predictor of atheism? And a new study finds that young Brits are twice as likely to pray regularly than their elders. What's up with that? Mike Erie joins Caitlin and Phil to parse the news of the day on this week's Holy Post. And now, the show. Hey there, this is Phil Vischer. Welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. I am here. I have an interesting assortment of people mm. today. Mm. I'm, I'm here with Jason. Hi, Jason. <laughs> hey there. Uh, that's not unusual. That's normal. And yep. we got Caitlin Shess here. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, Phil. Beaming in from Duke Divinity School, where you can mm. see the steam of smartness rising in the distance behind her. Mm. And Yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, we have a bald guy, but it's not the usual bald guy. I that's just right. joked before we start recording, that I can't do the show without at least one bald guy. So Sky was called away for a very, uh, we can't even talk about what he was called away for because it's Ooh. top secret. It's Ooh. top secret. Because that's the level of Christianity that he operates in, that sometimes he gets yep. called away for top secret Christianity things. Yeah, you should be called the most holy pod. <laughs> most, uh, most holy post. Yes, the holy most of holy, holy post. posts. Yes, and uh, so our our uh, designated hitter bald guy is Mike mm-hmm. Erie, our buddy I put Mike the, Erie. I put the ass in association. I didn't, when did I say association? You said an interesting. Oh, did you say assortment? <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to swear on my podcast. You just looked for a reason I to did. say something. This is. This isn't Listen. boxology, you know. <laughs> this isn't where you sit with your hipster friends in their beanies and you talk about the Bible and swear. <laughs> no, Mike, come on. Eerie. I'm sorry. I'm so All right. sorry. Here's the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. So Mike is the host of the Voxology Podcast, formerly Vox Podcast. Yeah, we were, we the were name. thinking. Well, we, yeah, we were we were thinking about holiest post. But the we holiest felt like post. that would infringe a little bit on you yeah. guys. So. Yeah, we have lawyers, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> we have lawyers. Because if there's one thing that we've learned about ministry, defend your turf. Yes. <laughs> yes. Just like Jesus did. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. He said, sorry, back off, John the Baptist. Your time is done. You're y'all take your disciples now. Okay. Uh, should I carry that any further? You think it's a good no. idea? To... No. No. Caitlin says no. No, thank Caitlin, you. Caitlin, playing the voice of reason. Mike, yeah. playing the voice. What would you say you're playing the voice of, Mike? You know, I'm trying to do my best Sky imitation. We okay. all know We all know Sky is just hanging off your coattails. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah. I, I made Sky. I yeah. made Sky. Yeah. When I met him, he he was lost in a parking lot of a Kroger's. He was just collecting carts and saying, does anybody think Jesus was serious? And no one was listening to him. And I said, oh, you poor, balding, uh, ethnically ambiguous cart collector. I will make a life for you. And he said, thank you. Thank you, kind sir. Yep. Yep. Are you are you the vegetable man? And I said, yes. I said, do you know the vegetable man? And he said, I do not know the vegetable man, but I think it could put me on the road to a successful career in ministry. That's right. Well, and that's why you wow. were hanging out at Kroger, right? Where else do you get vegetables and run into the vegetable man? <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Oh, dear. And Jason is here to be the voice of Cinnamon Rolls. And last week... We took a pilgrimage. Caitlin, you missed it because you're at Duke instead of Wheaton. If you'd gone to Wheaton, you could have come with us. <laughs> we took a pilgrimage to to Jason's favorite cinnamon roll place, Cineholic. 
in Naperville, Illinois, and we sampled. I had a plane, normal. I just, you have to mm. start with the normal, but then they, they go crazy mm. and throw all sorts of stuff on top of your cinnamon roll until you can't even find the cinnamon roll anymore. You're just eating a candy aisle with a spoon. <laughs> uh, Jason had the, you had the cookie monster, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was a little crazy. It was um, (laughs) like chocolate syrup and cookie dough and all sorts of stuff on top of a cinnamon roll. And I I almost passed out. after that. that, (laughs) Yeah. yeah, Cause that's what a cinnamon roll needs. Yeah. Cause if there's one thing you think when you're eating a cinnamon roll, it's like, this isn't sweet enough. No, this is too plain. (laughs) Jason, I've, I've been a secret stalker of your Twitter and (laughs) there are some things on there that are disturbing. I just want to be really, I want to be really honest about this. I, Such I, as? This is an, well, I mean, the cinnamon roll thing, for one. <laughs> um, there's no way you get to be that skinny and love cinnamon rolls. Okay? That's not how this works. Mm. Okay? So what? Mm-hmm. tell me, what sort of voodoo are you involved in? I, uh, I start every single day by walking at least 5K. <laughs> so then I can live the rest of my life happy. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh huh. All right. Uh-huh. I'm off that you, train already. Okay. You could do that. Mike, Mike, you could do it. Mike, you could totally do it. Start totally. the day with a 5K. That's our new, oh, our new start motto. Start the day with a 5K? Nice. Yes. Start the day with a 5K and the day with yeah. a cinnamon roll. Now that's a happy bring, life. And it brings balance to the force. Exactly. It brings balance exactly. to the force. Okay. We have, right. a lot, we have a lot to talk about today. So I want to jump right in. Sky's not here because he got called away for a top secret mission, but he did the interview. Um, I believe it's with uh, Derwin Gray. So that'll be cool. Derwin Ooh, Gray. Nice. We love nice. Derwin Gray. Yep. Sodom destroyed by meteor, scientists say, but biblical archaeologists not convinced. Now, this is one of those stories where I just, when I was younger, I found these stories fascinating. At my current age, I'm just not sure I care anymore. <laughs> you know, you know that like it was, it, it, it's like there was a big effort in the 80s and 90s, and I don't know, aughts maybe, to prove yeah. or disprove the Bible. It's like yeah. we're going to, you know, we're so close on both sides saying we're so close to completely proving the Bible or we're so close to completely exposing the Bible as a sham. And then, and then we were wrestling back and forth and Richard Dawkins was on one side and, you know, William Lane Craig and, yes. oh, Ravi Zacharias. We're on the other side and then, you know, I don't, I'm just not sure. So anyway, apparently a fireball exploded over the northern shore of the Dead Sea around 1650 BC, according to the findings of a multidiscipline team of 21 scientists. The explosion laid waste to the entire lower Jordan River Valley, sowing the Dead Sea with saltiness that ruined agriculture for several hundred years uh, and destroyed uh, a a very large city, about a hundred acre city located today, uh, which is called Tal El Hammam, east of the Jordan River. So some people have said, that's Sodom. This is Sodom. It must be Sodom because it was destroyed by literally fire raining from the sky. And they know this happened because they're like finding melted metals, you know, and Mm. melted bricks and like stuff that you have a hard time generating enough heat to melt. But all this stuff is melted. And the only way to get temperatures that high or over such a large area is if there was basically like a nuclear explosion just, you know, a few hundred feet up in the air or a meteor of relatively decent size that exploded like the one they think of that exploded in Siberia and knocked down like, you know, 18 million trees. So is this the question? Is this the one that killed the dinosaurs? You don't have to raise your hand. No, I don't believe the dinosaurs were (laughs) killed in 1650 BC. Okay. All right. Uh, The timeline's confusing. I can see you haven't spent a lot of time at the Creation Museum to have all your timelines <laughs> <laughs> lined up just perfectly. Listen, next weekend, we're, 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 we got so, the tour lined up. It'll be great. So people on one side are saying, well, maybe this inspired the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe this is like what they were thinking of when they wrote that. The other side is saying, no, 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 the timeline isn't right. It's happening at the wrong point in history. It, uh, Abraham was earlier than that. And we don't even think that's where Sodom was supposed to be. Maybe it was somewhere else. So the question is, okay, Caitlin, do, do you care? No. Okay, I, Mike. I, I, <laughs> Maybe, maybe I'm an old soul then, Phil, because I also do not care. No, I – you know what this reminds me of, actually? 
This what, is a this good. Radio? Um, when I was like in middle school, I was really struggling with my faith, and so I did what every middle schooler that is like me would do, which is I went to the library and I got like a ton of apologetics books. Mm. This was like oh. the year that Tim Keller's um, Reason for God came out. Yes, yeah, and and I, I was read like forty. I was in seventh grade and I, and I, I got that book. I got like all of these other books that scientists wrote. I got like all the Lee Strobel books. Mm -hmm. And I literally was like, I am going to study myself into believing that God is real because that's what I thought would fix my problems. And it was, there was a cycle that would happen just continually where I would read an argument in one of these books suddenly everything would make sense, either like a scientific or a historical or a what, you know, there's evidence of this event, or here's some rational, like logical argument for why God must exist or whatever. And I would get to like a convincing argument and suddenly be like, I believe. And I would have 24 hours of just like walking around in a cloud. Like I know my faith is real. I know God is real. Everything's great. And then at like 24 hours, suddenly like questions would pop into my head or like doubts would come up or I would just start to like that one amazing argument would not seem so convincing anymore. And okay. then I would just start it all over again. Mm. And it took a long time for me to get to a point where I was just, I realized what a gift faith was and why theologically some of these arguments might bolster my faith. It might be helpful to read an apologetics book or to think about the archaeological evidence and say, yes, I actually do believe scripture is an accurate witness of what happened in history. Sometimes it's symbolic, sometimes it's not, and we have to figure that out. But I do think it's it's an accurate witness to history and God's interaction with people in history. And that can bolster my faith, but it can't create faith. And I think I was in a point where my youth groups and my churches were encouraging questioning and like reading stuff, which is good, but it really kind of made me think, that if something like this happened, like, oh, there's archaeological evidence Sodom and Gomorrah was real, that that would somehow give me faith I didn't have before. And that was definitely not true. So I think that experience got me to a point where I just kind of don't care anymore. That's, that's interesting, because I had it in high school. I kind of went on a quest like that and was, you know, except I was reading Josh McDowell, because Tim Keller wasn't born yet when I was in high school. <laughs> uh, so I had to read Josh McDowell. Uh, you know, evidence that demands a verdict and more evidence that demands a verdict. And here's some extra evidence that might demand a verdict, but we're not sure. So we didn't put it in the first two books and, you know, mm -hmm. this whole series. <laughs> yeah. More than you a know, carpenter, bro. That was the big one. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm not even sure I read that one. I was just oh, yeah. I was just deep into 700 pages of evidence that demands a verdict. But I think I was trying to get myself to a point where I could convince, where I felt like I could convince anyone that my yeah. that I was believing the right things. Because if I could convince anyone, then I must be believing the right things. Mm. And if I couldn't convince someone else, then I then it brought suspicion. You know, like, well, if if this doesn't work for them, why does it work for me? Mm. And that was tough for me to get over because I just I was, you know, I was really kind of affected by what do other people think of my beliefs? And if mm. they see through them, why don't I? Mm. Mike, what did you do when you were in high school and which apologist did it involve? <laughs> uh, J.P. Moreland oh, and okay. uh, William okay. Lane Craig. Okay, were the two two big ones. And now you used to you used to like debate atheists in college, oh, yeah. right? Because you oh, went absolutely. to you went to school with Sky, and yeah. he talks about you being like a wild man yeah. doing atheist debates. <laughs> yeah, I, I got wow. my master's in philosophy of religion um, uh, from JP and William Lane Craig and others, and so yeah, I was I, I wanted to go teach um, philosophy in a kind of non-Christian setting, just follow sort of the Dallas Willard model. And as I reflect back on that, um, I have very similar reactions to you that, that I don't care. Um, but the reason I don't care wait, is- Wait, 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 wait. Don't care about what? Let's be a little, yeah. more, okay. let's I be a little more specific. I don't care about vegetables. I don't care about <laughs> cinnamon rolls. Um, oh, no, no, hurts. I don't- that, that the way I conceived of the role of apologetics and that whole exercise, of it was, it was a misconstruing of what faith is and what faith does and how faith works and kind of a, uh, an entrance into the Bible that puts on the Bible modern enlightenment sort of expectations for it to make perfect sense and to meet uh, expectations that, frankly, none of the biblical authors were ever trying to meet. 
And so the, my faith became real when I let the Bible sort of be itself rather than mm -hmm. kind of foist these other sort of assumptions and expectations on it. One of which was that there would be this massive amount of external confirmation whenever we looked into history. There'd be nothing unclear. It would either be pro or con. There'd be right. no ambiguity right. um, or no internal tension. Right. And so once my, we once we dig down to the right layer of the city of Jericho, we will yeah. see exactly yes. what the yes. Israelites did. Yes. And so the reason I don't care is it because it's not important. I think that's fascinating. It's a fascinating question. Did Israel, uh, like a flood story, when we realize that other cultures are saying, "Hey, there was a flood." What you know? Which way do you take that? Was Israel borrowing and subverting? Was Israel original in its thought, and the other cultures were adapted? Who knows? So I find that an interesting question. But faith for me doesn't hinge on really anything other than if you were to falsify the resurrection account at that at that point, you know, the because my faith isn't in the Bible. My faith is in Jesus, and because of Jesus, then I I take the Bible seriously. So if you got rid of Jesus somehow, then yes, the, that would be far more important. Than getting so, rid of Sodom, yeah. you're putting you're putting more emphasis on Jesus than on Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> well, reasonable. at least the details, yes, yes. Because yes, I'd yes. say there's there's some there's some preachers in some circles that preach on Sodom and Gomorrah almost as often as they preach on Jesus. Yeah. And, and it's fascinating when Paul and the early apostles were summarizing the biblical message. Sodom and Gomorrah was not on their their radar of the greatest hits, you know, in huh. proclaiming Jesus. I know it's shocking. Huh. So, huh. so yes, and, and it does raise up. It raises all sorts of interesting questions about the Bible and how do we understand the Bible? Is the Bible flat, and you just read the verses as they come to us without any hermeneutical complexity, or as Caitlin was suggesting, I couldn't agree with her more that there are things that are symbolic that have have real reference, but there. They're literarily using genres that include all sorts of symbolism and whatever else. And so that's okay. Right. So I'm okay with if Sodom and Gomorrah was a real city being destroyed in this real way, or it became a template of what happens to evil as it's used right. in the New Testament. I'm okay with that. I think the much more interesting question is not like, was Sodom and Gomorrah this instance that they found in the archaeology? I think the more interesting question is, if you really believe that whether this was a story that got told or whether this happened literally, that the point of the story is nations who mistreat foreigners are harshly judged by God. If you think that's what the story is about, which I think it very clearly is, it's clear in the story. It's much clearer in Ezekiel who says you mistreated the poor and the vulnerable, and that is why you are being harmed. If any of that is even a little bit true, I don't know why we're like tinkering around with what archaeologists are doing. I think we as people who live in a nation that mistreats foreigners should be incredibly right. concerned. <sighs> Hard to argue with that. Is, right. is it that, Mike, do you think it shows how much we've been influenced by m just modernity that we want to be able to like buckle all these things down in a science textbook and either say we've shown that this could only be direct divine intervention or, you know, or and that it happened exactly the way right. it's described? Yeah, I don't I don't think the ancient Israelites operated with the dichotomy between supernatural and natural that we carry around. They, they, that right. was not their worldview at all. Um, we think if something's natural, that means God wasn't involved. And if, if something's supernatural, that means that natural wasn't involved. And you're like, yeah. that's just not how the Old Testament conceives of God's agency in the world. Very often, God's sovereignty and agency is expressed through his image bearers. And... Uh, and the fact that the, his image bearers are doing something doesn't mean that he's not doing something. And the fact that he's doing something doesn't mean that his image bearers are not doing something. So there's this kind of co-terminus uh, or co-almost causation of things that are happening in the world that are rendered. Um, and, and Jesus even gets angry at this when this introduction of um, this sort of uh, dichotomy when, you know, he talks about the tower that fell on some of the, mm. you know, Galileans. He's like, you know, do you, what, do you, do you think they were somehow worse sinners, you know, because they were reading, the, the Jews were reading, oh, well, they must have been. They were drawing a religious point. From yeah, this. the ones that were downhill from the tower. Were, <laughs> yes, were, yes. Somehow that, that were, was God's, you know. The holy God. ones were uphill. Yeah, which is a lesson for us all. Yes, stand uphill. Particularly the flood narrative. Um, 
<laughs> so I don't, I don't think, again, I think this is a great example of us sort of pushing onto the Bible assumptions that are just so natural for us, but they, they, they didn't distinguish natural and supernatural the same way we did. So of right. course it, it could be bottled up and that could be an act of Yahweh or Yahweh could have stopped it. Either way, Yahweh was responsible because his people crossed over the river on dry land. Right. And that darn meteor could have landed, could have fallen harmlessly into the ocean. Totally. Harmlessly. Instead, it turned Lot's wife to salt. <laughs> can a meteor do that? Do we, can we, have we worked on a way for a meteor to turn a woman into salt? Cause that, I'm that's where sure someone has, that's the element we're missing. Maybe it, it literally, it, like, it's the literal element we're missing. In it's the literal, is what oh, we're that's missing. That's good. Yes. Okay. 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 Speaking of having your faith or not having your faith, <laughs> new psychology research identifies a robust predictor of atheism in adulthood. Did you see this story? I hope you saw it because I sent it to you. So if you didn't see it, <laughs> yes. then I don't yes. know why I'm, I'm sending you things. Um, okay. People have kind of speculated over the years, you know, what makes what makes people more likely to be religious and what makes people less likely to be religious? And there have been lots of theories like, are you, uh, are you generally fearful in the way you look at the world or are you generally mm. open to, you know, new experiences and new ideas? Are you more cognitively, cognitively driven? Um, are you more feeling driven? And so we come up with theories, you know, if you're more skeptical, if you're just naturally more skeptical, you're more likely to be an atheist. If you're naturally more trusting, you're more likely to be religious. And those have been some of the theories that people have put forth. And this, so this was a fairly big study to say, okay, are those the biggest flags, you know, that you can find the mm -hmm. biggest uh, indicators that, okay, you might grow up to be an atheist. And they discovered, no, that there's one much bigger predictor of who will or won't grow up to be an atheist or religious. And the predictor is people who grew up in a home with relatively little credible displays of faith <laughs> are more likely to be atheists. Uh, cultural transmission or lack thereof is a stronger predictor of religious disbelief than any other factor, uh, such as heightened analytic thinking. So it may not be because <laughs> you're more logical or smarter, and it may actually be because it's what you saw modeled or didn't see modeled. I when like when we have to have we have to have Shocker. studies that determine these things that we all already knew. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Shocker. When I see my parents pretending to be religious, but then I see what they're like at home. That actually pushes oh. me away. News at 11. <laughs> <laughs> the researchers found evidence that a lack of exposure to credibility enhancing displays of religious faith was a key predictor of atheism. In other words, those that grew up with caregivers who faithfully modeled their religious beliefs, such as going to religious services or acting fairly to others because their religion taught them so, were less likely to be atheists. Right. So, so it doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> if you grew up with atheists, you're right. more likely to be an atheist. But if you grew up with uncredible displays of totally. religion, you're more likely to be an atheist. And that's can't you, interesting. Can't you multiply this throughout the church right now? Caitlin, I'd love your take on this. That, that in the household of faith that we call the American church, there is such a lack of credible Ooh. caregivers Yes. That we're we're that we're seeing Cred just people. This is our new this is our new phrase. Uh, credibility enhancing displays of religious faith. Yes, aren't we yes. seeing a lot of those on in the news these days? Yeah, I mean, Caitlin, how do you how do you hear that? Is it just uh, the no dust statement that it kind of appears to be? Because it seems like this is being writ large, way beyond faith environments and households. But now we're seeing, you know, the the fleeing of America evangelicalism. Yeah. I mean, I remember one of my first classes in seminary on spiritual formation, we were talking about evangelism and we were talking about how like the seminary's history with evangelism had been a very like, here's a tract, you know, make sure that you turn to the person sitting next to you in the airplane and say, if we crashed, where would you go when we die? Like it was, we, we had a kind of set thing of answers and questions and this is how you do it and you do it constantly and you don't really have a relationship with people and you don't really care what they do after they pray the prayer. 
But now our new curriculum at evangelism is so focused on relationship building and building community in your like in your actual community, finding spaces like coffee shops where you can, you know, meet people that you wouldn't otherwise meet, all that kind of stuff. And to introduce this curriculum change, the professor would ask, like, raise your hand if the person that led you to Christ was someone that you had either a very close relationship with as a child or who was in your family. And it was like universal. I mean, there were very few people that didn't raise their hands. Most of the people who didn't were honestly people who were international students who heard the gospel from a missionary or in a church, you know. But if they were from the United States, the likelihood was they were led to Christ by someone that they knew very closely, especially someone who was a child. And to me, not only is this an indictment on our credible witness in general, like you said, Mike, like in the household of faith, but it's also an indictment on the way that a lot of our children's ministries and a lot of our youth ministries are focused on entertainment and are focused on like, how do we just get kids to stay here? Like if we give pizza and if we like put on a good show and get people here and we don't think at all about the things that they are learning from their leaders when it comes to the lives that they're living, the way that they're talking about things that they care about. I mean, the church that I was in in Dallas, they had me come in and talk about social justice to the high schoolers because the leaders there went, these are things they care about. They recognize this has a relationship to scripture, but they're also looking around at a lot of churches in our area in Dallas where things were not great politically. And they're feeling like there's such a serious disconnect between the way scripture talks about things and the way Christians are actually acting, that this is the place where we now need to spend the most time talking is yes, our faith has resources for thinking about social justice. But that's very different than like, come out, come hang out and eat pizza together. And we're not going to really talk about anything substantial because, you know, it doesn't really matter if we're really talking about the things that people are concerned about and showing that with our lives, there's consistency between our teaching and our lives. That plays a huge impact. But most of the conversations I was involved in when it came to youth and children's was just like, how do we give them information? How do we pump in enough Bible stories? How do we make sure that like they know the right answers to questions? How are they reading apologetic kind of things instead Mm -hmm. of like, Are there relationships they have with people, especially with adults who aren't their parents, actually? Like, parents are really important, but also do they have relationships with adults that are living actually, like, credible, faithful lives that could give them the resources they need when things get harder as they grow up? So what would we say? I'm curious. I'm sorry, Phil, if you were going to jump in. I was going to jump in because it's my show, Mike. So that's why I was going to jump. I was just going to ask, are you saying that watching VeggieTales isn't enough for children? (laughs) (laughs) Um, this guy sounds like that's what you're saying. I think I'm saying it is not enough for children. Mm-hmm. Okay. But you know what, Phil? What I Caitlin? had parents. I had parents that showed me good veggie for tales. you. Oh, yeah. I had parents that showed me Veggie Tales so often that my dad still has the songs memorized. Uh huh. But they also were serving in their community and were going to like I believed they believed what they were telling me. I didn't okay. think they were doing this so that I could learn some morals. You and, like, believe they, could stop. they believed Bob the Tomato. I mean, that's a way you could put it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. When he said, when he said, remember kids, God made you special and he loves you very much. You yeah. believed. They believed that was true. I believed they believed that was true. Okay, Mike, what were you gonna say? Well, first of all, where is my hairbrush still haunts me. Yeah. Um, that yeah. I, yeah, I you... sometimes when I drift off at night, that sort of sits there and I wonder uh-huh. what it would be like to ask that question. And you are kind of Larry the Cucumber <laughs> from the neck up. You know, I, or, or Bob the Tomato. I mean, if you put the jowls I... in there. <laughs> um, anyway, no, what, what I wanted to know for, for, from the both of you is what, what do we want to define as credibility enhancing behaviors? Because <laughs> loads of religious people, Caitlin and I are ruminating on a show on Netflix that we will not recommend to people, <laughs> but it is all about this this sort of uh, uh, the performative nature of doing the right things. Um, what would you guys put in the category of credibility enhancing versus, because I'm sure loads of people would, would point to their church involvement or their Bible studies or their, you know, they get up every morning and have a devotional life. Are those the things we're talking about? Or is it something more than that? You know, I have a very strong memory when I was a kid of a church that we were really deeply involved in. My mom was on staff at some point. We were, you know, we were there. If if the credibility enhancing action was be in church, we were in church all of the time. But the thing that I remember about that is not that. The thing that I remember is when a single mother in that church really desperately needed some financial help 
And my, I remember sitting in the back of my mom's car as she dropped off this kind of extravagant present for this woman secretly. Like it was during the nighttime so that this woman would not know who had given it to her. Like that is a, that is a strong memory that I have that I think is a credibility enhancing act of faith that my mom had a relationship with someone in the church who had a need found a way to meet it. And that there's something distinctly Christian about doing it secretly. Like, so it wasn't just, they did good things, which they did. Lots of people do good things. They did good things. And I saw a clear connection between the That's fact so that we good. prayed together, the fact that I, scripture was constantly in my house. Like that wasn't separate from this act of service to this woman. It was motivated mm -hmm. clearly by that. And I think those are the kinds of things, like when I talk to kids now, I love being around kids at church. When they talk about their parents, they talk about things like that more than they talk. They talk about going to church. They talk about reading their Bible. I love when I hear a kid say, we pray all the time in my house or we read the Bible all the time. I love that. But those are not necessarily the stories that kids are left with. I think the thing that reminds you this is a real thing is when there were kind of extreme actions like that that don't make sense mm -hmm. apart from the faith. Mm. So good. Yeah, I think I think credibility enhancing is is almost anything that manifests the fruit of the spirit. Mm. You know, because when you see the fruit of the spirit coming out of someone's life, you just naturally think they're onto something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like you've got you've and that's and that's what you know that's what really troubled me about my own life in the, in the peak of like Veggie Tales success is that it was making me miserable. You know, because I was trying to do a job I wasn't suited for, and I was feeling all this stress that God never gave me. You know, I just put, mm. took it on myself. And I just remember really being confronted with, like, I do not see the fruit of the Spirit in my own life, you know, and yet I'm on the, you know, they're putting me on the covers of Christian magazines as a model mm. of the next generation of Christian leader. I'm like, I'm miserable. I'm freaking miserable. Mm -hmm. What do my kids think when they look at me? You know, yeah. and that and that was pretty convicting of like what that's not so the number of videos I was selling was not necessarily credibility building. Um the life, just the the character of the nature of my life was what should have been credibility building, you know, and, and I think that's been much more so the case post veggie than than pre-veggie, you know, and sticking with difficult relationships, doing things where the world says bail. You know, mm -hmm. like your marriage is hard. I don't know if you've noticed that, Mike. I don't know. Caitlin, Jason, either of you. Oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> marriage is is just hard. And the testimony of being how many years have you been married, Mike? 20. 20. That's good. 31. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, so dude, just the, you, got the, you got married at 16. I mean, clearly. <laughs> well, 15, but close. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, the testimony of that to your kids, that's like, that's credibility building. You know, why, yeah. why do I do yeah. the hard work? Because number one, I don't believe this life is all I have. I don't believe I have to find my best life, my ultimate happiness. You know, that always yeah. leads you wondering, did I pick the right person? Maybe there's someone better out there. I don't care. I don't care if there's someone better out there because this isn't my only life. My life goes on forever, you know, so so I don't feel that urge to always try to improve and, and get better and level up. And it's like, no, I'm sticking with my commitments um, and I'm making the best. I'm doing the hard work. And I, I find, you know, for my kids that to be very credibility building. Uh, mm. Jason, anything bumping around your mind? So um, I've been I've been thinking about this ever since you guys were talking about, you know, apologetics that you guys went to and, and everything. Um being raised kind of Christian, but not exactly. Uh, Phil, I will say Veggie Tales was a lifeline. Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. But, uh, <laughs> did you hear that, Mike? But, Mike, did you hear that, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> um, my main um, uh, gift is is faith. Um, mm. So I I never really had a moment where I was like, you know, I need to go find something to build my faith back up. I've just always had mm. this faith that I don't exactly understand why, because I don't line up with what you guys are saying at all of the, the credibility. It's like, I did not grow up in church. I chose to go to youth group on my own. It's like, mm. um, mom kind of taught us the Bible, but that was it. Dad doesn't read the Bible. It's like, mm. you know, kind of on my own, kind of with a weird, uh, Christian homeschooling, uh, you know, curriculum, that was kind of all I had. And I found my faith um, 
in middle school and then on into high school is when it was reaffirmed um, for me. When I got to college, I was like, I was interested in other religions. I wanted to learn about them, but I never had any temptation to switch. I never thought I saw, I don't, I don't know. None of this adds up for me. <laughs> for me, it's, mm-hmm. it's totally mm-hmm. the opposite. I, I, I had to find it on my own. Um, at least that's what it felt like at the time. Um, so yeah, I well, don't, I you don't know and if... you and Bob the Tomato had to find yeah. it together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what to do with uh, any of this, but it's been fascinating to listen to all of your stories. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, last story. This just in from the UK. Uh, they did a big survey in the UK, and the younger younger generation in the UK is now more likely to pray than the over fifty fives. Young people in the UK are twice as likely as older people to pray regularly. A new survey has found. Um, and before you think this is a bunch of you know young white Brits going back to the Church of England. That's not necessarily what is happening, which explains this. Uh, As the the demography of the UK changes, minority faiths do tend to have a larger proportion of practicing young people. Therefore, as the population of these minority groups increases within the UK, so will the prayer habits of the population at large. Mm. So this is the UK wrestling with the fact that, you know, as they get younger, they get less and less white. And interestingly, because in the U.S., we're so, you know, we're so, us conservatives are so resistant to immigrants. It's like, no more, we need to stay white. You know, we don't want to get brown. We don't like, and what the U.K. is discovering is that they're actually, they're becoming more religious. They're becoming, you know, the nation prays more because they're less white. Um, In the the case of the U.K., the bulk of the the non-white immigrants are Muslim. Uh, but in the U.S., the bulk of the non-white mi- immigrants are Catholic and, you know, Presbyterian and, and mm. uh, Pentecostal. Mm. So it does make you wonder if if we're worried about the secularization of the United States, should we also be anti-immigrant? Oh, wow. Mike? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> well, I think there are great biblical reasons for, independent of that one, about why we should not be (laughs) anti-immigrant. What? Um, I know. What in the world? Was that thunder? Was that? Okay. Caitlin, what is happening? (laughs) Yes. And also the first really big one, which I don't think you guys heard, happened right when you, Phil, said something about being against immigrants. It was like, it was like, that's the judgment of God. Oh, wow. Sodom and Gomorrah, part two. Clearly, clearly God is on my side. I hope Caitlin doesn't turn to salt. (laughs) Did you say anything bad at the wrong time? No. Okay. (laughs) So sorry, Mike. No, no, no. So we should not be we should not be opposed to immigrants, even if we're not worried about secularization. Yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> there, there, I mean, this whole OK Boomer thing that's going on that the 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 criticism of older folks of the younger generation is just has reached a fever pitch. And and I and I and I think, and Caitlin and Jason both. I mean, you fall into the younger category. I'm just outside of it um, as a 35 year old. <laughs> um, but I was, I, I, I think there, because of the fear that we're, you know, kind of baking in, in the world and fear of the other and whatever else, there are just these massive stereotypes older people have about younger people. And it's beautiful when these things sort, sort of get exposed because instead of, it seems like, and I'm generalizing based on a very small sample, but it seems like. Um, as you age, you either welcome the next generation or resist them. And, um, and the resisting of them seems to be happening more and more um, as the world around us sort of changes and all these cultural battles are raging. And I think that's kind of untold harm um, because there is wisdom uh, that, that actually happens when you get older that could be given and would be sought if there was an openness to what God is doing among younger people. And so, I don't know, it just, this seems to me to paint a picture of a kind of generational repentance that should be taking place um, instead of a, a really judgmental and critical spirit of some of the younger expressions and explorations of faith. Hmm. How's that? How does that strike you? Caitlin? Yeah. I mean, 
the, the first thought that I had was when you sent that article was that there's a big difference between like the seculariz- secularization thesis that like took on almost a religious, I don't know if you heard that again, the thunder went off, like God is not happy with the secularization thesis, um, <laughs> took on kind of like a religious flavor of like, we so strongly believe that as countries modernize, they will become less religious to the point where it didn't matter if the data contradicted that, that's just what people in universities believed. There's a difference between that and the idea that we have gotten more pluralistic and that there just are, as the article describes, younger people of all sorts of different faiths. And I do think that sometimes older generations of evangelical Christians in particular were so concerned with sort of maintaining institutional church power and maintaining cultural and political power that any shift in any of that is just conceived as negative. Whereas actually, I think we have an opportunity here to think about how... (laughs) That one was it's my really, stomach. It's that really, it's really. That was my stomach. Yeah. I missed lunch. That was clearly God <laughs> applauding your last statement. Yeah, we can interpret each thunderclap depending on mm-hmm. if I think yeah. it's a good or a bad <laughs> thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but I think there's just incredible potential when there was actually a point in which it seems like less and less people were believing in anything transcendent or anything supernatural. And mm-hmm. that's not true now. There are tons of young people who, even if they're not Christians or they're not evangelical Christians or they're not white evangelical Christians, mm-hmm. they are praying because they believe in something transcendent. And that I think is not only an opening for us to have better conversations about religion amongst people of differences, but it also is an opening because I think it's just better for our communities if we have a sense there is something beyond the material world. I don't think that's a helpful way for us to think about how we live together in community. I don't think it helps us value human beings or value their spiritual lives if we're just materialistic. And so this is a good thing in all of those kinds of accounts. And I do think the tension is that a lot of younger people want to just embrace all of the the pluralistic and they don't understand why people older than them would feel like this was a loss. But I think like Mike said, if there's an ability for us to have conversations across generations to say, look at the gift that your wisdom brings for us to navigate something difficult, but then also look at how the fact that I never grew up in a country where white evangelical Christians were the majority, that could be a gift to help people older than me learn how to navigate it. But most of the churches that I've been in, even if we're multi-generational in a certain sense, we're completely two separate churches within one church. We're not talking to each other. We're not building relations. And that's a loss to the church in our evangelism and in our helping communities flourish. There was um, uh, the 1960s, that that radical generation. <laughs> Mike says, yay. Um, there was- She's so the, damn smart, Phil. <laughs> Mike, we I'm don't sorry. swear on this podcast. Um, okay, Mike. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mike, we okay. don't swear. Put okay. it in the put it in the swear jar. Put your okay. money in the swear jar. I owe you two dollars. No, it's seventy five hundred dollars. That's that's how much it, <laughs> our audience has grown. So your oh, swear okay. your swear fee has grown. Nineteen um, sixties. A lot of the radical kids, you know, the rebels, the hippies, the dropouts. A lot of their rebellion was against what they perceived as kind of the sellout materialism of their parents. You know, of the the nineteen fifties. So good. You know, fat America generation. Um, and I'm just wondering if we're headed into a similar period, but even mm-hmm. within the church, you know, where we've got a generation of spiritual kids who kind of are looking at dis- with disgust at their parents' church, you know, at the church of the generation before me, which they'll say it became, you know, too political or too right wing or, or, you know, not kind uh, too judgmental, you know, and with LGBTQ issues, it's a big one where, you know, it's hypocrisy. Why are you making such a big deal out of, you know, this one area of our lives? What do Sky would call crotch Christianity, you know, where we only <laughs> care about what happens between your knees and your belly button and nothing oh. else in your life. Um, you can't yell at me for I cussing. Said crotch. Crotch ain't no cuss, Mike. Crotch ain't no <laughs> really? cuss. Put that on really? a t-shirt, Jason. So, hey, would you use no, the word you. crotch in a sermon, Phil? Would, would you I use, use it on a VeggieTales episode? Those are two different veggie things. Yeah, two different <laughs> veggies don't have crotches. <laughs> veggies don't have crotches. Good just, point. Bob and Larry would just stare at me and say, uh, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it feels like, this is what I'm getting to. It feels like I'm going to wrap all of this up. Like every story except Sodom. I got nothing on Sodom. Um, it feels like I, we have a generation that's saying, you know what? Apologetics are not what we need. 
right now. That's not what we're wrestling with. We're not wrestling with whether the the parting of the Red Sea is scientifically plausible. We're not wrestling with that. We're wrestling because we're spiritual already. We're spiritual already. 75% of Americans believe in religious miracles. Okay, there's like 8% are legitimately evangelical, according to Barna. 75% have no problems with the idea of a deity that intervenes in that in the natural world. So it's not that we've rejected the supernatural, it's that we've rejected hypocrisy. So if you say your religion is about love and kindness and peace and joy, and you're cranky and yelling at everybody. So that's what kids, the, the kids, can I say the kids? That's what the kids... Yeah. See, God just said, See, "Amen." God approves. God approves. Yeah, or, or is trying to uh, kill me and missed. Um, so anyway, that's that's well, what I'm running Phil, with. Yeah. Can I can I Caitlin. tell you how, how Sodom and Gomorrah actually incorporates into all of your tying Do up there? Do it. It's, yeah. It's the hypocrisy thing because when Ezekiel is talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and gives us more details about their sin that they mistreated the poor and the vulnerable. It's in relationship to Israel. It's saying and you're they actually did, worse. They did bad things with their crotches. Uh, yes, <laughs> in in abusing though the poor and the vulnerable. I mean that's the that's the story. Okay. okay. But also when Mike Ezekiel did a face, got Mike to do a face palm. That was amazing. I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen that before. Sorry, sorry, Caitlin. I don't know that I've ever done one before, but that was so worthy. <laughs> it was so worthy. <laughs> Caitlin is going, just going, and it's going to be brilliant. Mm. Ezekiel is making a point about how bad Israel is because they are yes. the ones that are supposed to know better. And yet they are worse than Sodom and Gomorrah in their mistreatment of the poor and the vulnerable. And that's the kind of apologetic that young people want Come is on. being serious about your faith to the point in which you actually care for the poor and the vulnerable. You do what scripture tells you to do. You don't just know the right Bible verses to say, but those impact your life to the point where you sacrifice for people Come who are on. more vulnerable than you. And the indictment of Israel in that passage is an indictment of other people in the world are doing these really terrible things. You are just as bad as them. And that would be true of the American church today. So the apologetic is less, here's a book that gives you all the logic and reason and the history. The apologetic is we have the reputation that Israel had at that point of mistreating the poor and the vulnerable. If people in actual human relationships in churches and communities see Christians that aren't following that pattern anymore, that will be an apologetic to them that the faith is true, that they're not falling into that same hypocrisy anymore. Oh, man. Can I cuss after that? Can I? No. Can I... Well, <laughs> yes, because I need the money. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin, that it. was awesome. Well, so well said. Definitely. You're, you're the best hype man, Mike. Yeah. Just have it's not him hype. Come, that's just true. You have I mean, come you to all your so speaking gigs and articulate. sit in the audience and say, amen. I'll do um, that. I'll I have do that. to issue an apology to Chrissy Stroop. Last week on the show, I mentioned the journalist Chrissy Stroop, and Sky said, how old is she? And I guessed, and I was way off. I, I guessed uh -oh. around 60. Uh, I don't know why. I'm not even sure why I said that, but she reached out to me, the journalist. And and said I'm 41. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm oh, so that's sorry. Bad. I know it's really bad. So I apologized, to Chrissy. I think I was confusing her with someone else. I don't know. So she's not. She's 41, which actually makes sense for the story last week. That the way it makes more sense that she's 40ish than that she's 60ish. So my apologies to Chrissy Stroop. She's one of the leading um, leaders of the evangelical movement. And I believe listens to the podcast. So hi, Chrissy. Thanks for listening. And Mike. Eerie, thanks for thanks for filling in our filling our sky shaped void. Uh, <laughs> and so, and so plus, well. some. Plus, plus some, plus a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> a little extra. Uh, That's fine. Caitlin, thank you again. Uh, your next book, we're waiting for that proposal. You're supposed yep. to be turned in Let's by go. the end of. <laughs> What else are you doing, Caitlin? Come on. Not enough. I am not doing enough. Uh, Mike, uh, seriously, listen to Mike's podcast, the Voxology Podcast. Where's the best way to find it? Just type Voxology on iTunes. You got it. Or on okay. uh, Anchor. Did you, or is your new Spotify. website up yet? Is your new website up yet? We have a landing page, my friend. Oh, okay. So is that a yes or no? Page. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say that's a color a no. palette. It's very exciting. Uh, uh, it takes more than a color palette to, to make it in this world. No, no way, man. man. No, yeah. we have such but a good it, color palette. But you got to start with the color Our palette. Our color palette is killer. 
Okay. Thank you all. Thank you for supporting us. All our Patreon supporters. There are a few new ones every day. We love you guys. Uh, you keep the trains running and we'll keep doing this. If uh, you guys keep showing up, we'll talk to you next week. The Holy Post podcast is brought to you by listeners like you. You can support our work on Patreon where you can receive bonus interviews, access to monthly live streams with the Holy Post crew and get exclusive Holy Post merch. To check it out, go to holypost.com and look for the button that says support us on Patreon. Okay, this week, Sky sits down with one of our most popular recurring guests, Derwin Gray. Pastor Gray is a former NFL linebacker and founding pastor of Transformation Church near Charlotte. He has a new book out titled, God, Do You Hear Me? that dives into the Lord's Prayer. Here's his interview with Sky. Hey, Derwin Gray, welcome back to The Holy Post. What's up, Sky? It's always good to be with you, man. I mean, we can continue our bromance. And by the way, by, by the way, my my wife is like, I don't know who Sky Jatani is, but that name has got to be one of the best names in the history of humanity. Sky Jatani. I mean, that's dope. It seems like you should be wearing like a robe and floating. Well, that's yeah, that's what I do around the house. I wear a bathrobe and I float around. And I'm sure um, your kids are impressed with, with, with you, right? Oh yeah, totally. I, you know, it, I'm, it's somewhat <laughs> gratifying to hear her say something like that about my name because growing up with the name, I hated it. I mean, hated it. All I wanted to be was like a Michael or a David or a Brian or something. Oh no, um, man. But my, my parents had the foresight to give me a name where the URL would be available. So yeah. grateful for that. Yeah. Um, welcome back. Um, you are writing books at a pace I can't quite keep up with, <sighs> but you have a new one out called God, Do You Hear Me?, which is focused on the Lord's Prayer. This is coming after, I think our last conversation was about The Good Life, which is the book you wrote about the Beatitudes. Yeah. Um, how are you producing so many books right now? Oh, my gosh. So so, so God is, is very kind. He has a sense of humor, because I can promise you, if my high school English teacher knew that Derwin Gray was an author of multiple books. And if she was an atheist, she would become a believer, but not like a Presbyterian. She would become like a Pentecostal charismatic. She'd go, <laughs> there is a God that exists. And so what happened was, is my family and I uh, were, on va- were on vacation. We were in Oslo, Norway for my son's senior spring break. He wanted to go to Norway. On his mother's side, uh, she has Viking um, blood. And so we wanted to go to Norway and Denmark. So anyway, I was telling my daughters, we we're walking downtown Nor- Norway at night, is I said, you know, Broadman and Holdman has offered me a two book contract to write on the Beatitudes and to write on the Lord's Prayer. But I was given all these excuses of why I shouldn't write. I was saying like, you know, it's about your platform. It's about marketing and all this stuff. And she stopped me in my tracks and said, Dad, if God is calling you to write this book, you write it for him. If he's calling you to do it, he's the only audience that you're writing for. And she really not called me out, but called me up. And so the first thought was, oh, my gosh, my daughter's been listening all these years. Praise God. And my second thought was she's right. So I'm going to start to write. And so The Good Life became a national best seller. And then I did a two book deal. So uh, now, God, do you hear me? Discovering a prayer that God always answers will be out October 5th. And then in 2022 with Tyndale, I have a book that'll be out called How to Heal the Racial Divide, What the Bible Says and What the First Christians Knew About Racial Reconciliation. And so during the pandemic, there were a lot of things shut down, but my writing sped up. And so I'm grateful and I'm thankful. And I just want to give my contribution to the body of Christ to just see how how epic and how lovely Jesus is. And so the Beatitudes deals with character formation. The Lord's Prayer deals with intimacy and how to heal the racial divide is kind of like my magnus opus on how we as Christians can walk in the unity across ethnic lines because Jesus and his cross broke them down. And what you just described is part of the reason we have a bromance because you're writing so much focuses on the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, the Lord's Prayer, and then these really relevant topics of racial reconciliation in the church and in the culture, which so many church leaders are reluctant to talk about. This is why I love you. I love this content, and I hope you keep producing it. And I I know it's not easy. Writing is difficult. Um, You mentioned your teacher would 
be a convert if she realized you were writing books now. I yeah. when when I was in elementary school, I was in special education. My teachers mm-hmm. told my mom he'll never go to college. He you know mm-hmm. just and so my dad too also laughs. He can't believe he, that I'm a writer because of um, all the struggles I had as a kid. But yeah, here we are. You never know what God's going to do. God is gracious, indeed. All right, let's talk about prayer. Um, one of the things you talk about early in the book is how the disciples came to Jesus and and said, "Teach us to pray." They were there was something about the way Jesus prayed that was surprising to them. Mm-hmm. Of course, growing up in a, in a Jewish environment in the first century, prayer was all around them. They were used to, but they saw something different yeah. in the way Jesus prayed. And one of the things that strikes me about their question is it's not a question we hear a lot in the American church. You know, we, we want to go to Jesus and say, "Make us better leaders. Teach us how to lead. Teach us how to grow our churches. Teach us how to impact the culture. Teach us how to transform whatever." But we're not asking much about prayer. It's not a huge felt need in the North American context, which is probably why books on prayer don't tend to sell super well until yours comes out and it becomes a bestseller, I'm sure. Um, How do you explain that? And how, as a pastor, do you help your people gain a vision and desire for prayer when most people, you know, they don't really care? Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'll I'll attempt to answer the second question first. The way as as an elder pastor at our church to get our people to pray is I pray for them that, that the Christian life is one giant exercise of praying. It's one giant exercise of saying, God, not my will, but thy will be done. And so I pray for my people that the Holy spirit would develop their affections to pray and not just pray to get stuff from Jesus, but to get Jesus right? So we as Americans, and I love my, my country, you know, we, we have faults and everything, but I love being an American, right? Uh, one of the blessings is that we are incredibly p- prosperous. Even our poor in America compared to the poor around the world, our poor are rich. So I grew up poor by American st- standards on welfare. When I went to Calcutta, India, I seen real poverty, And I'm like, you know what? The poor I grew up in would be middle class or rich there. And so I think as a result of our prosperity, we don't really pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread and really mean it. Whereas in other parts of the world and in Jesus's day, like a prayer for daily bread was an urgent necessity. It was like you need oxygen to fill your lungs. And so therefore, we need prayer to fill our souls, that prayer is oxygen to our souls because the Spirit of God breathes life into us. And so what we've typically done is we we, te- we treat Jesus like a consumer product. It's like going into Walmart or Target. We have a felt need. We, we pull uh, Jesus off the shelf and apply him to our felt need and then put him back. And so what we've got to learn to do is that prayer is not primarily about getting things. Prayer is not about changing God. Prayer is about us getting God so he can change us to reflect the Son of God through the Spirit of God. That what we're all in a race for, whether through accomplishments or whatever it may be, what we're really asking for is, I want to be who I've been created to be. The problem is, is we're going to the wrong people. We're going to the wrong places. We're going to the wrong things to possess. And God is saying, in the Lord's Prayer, I'm going to mold you and I'm going to shape you into who you were created to be. I'm going to change your desires. I'm going to change your outlet because you're going to see me. The Lord's prayer is about intimacy in to me, you see. And when we see him and our hearts are open to him, he can transform us to be the people he's created us to be. Okay. So throughout most of Christian history and and throughout many traditions of the church, the Lord's prayer has always been present in our gatherings. It's been present in our worship. It's been recited, you know, in classes and catechism and worship and communion and over and over and over again. But in a lot of contemporary American evangelicalism, we don't do that anymore. No. We don't we don't use written prayers, period, which is an interesting conversation to have and why we don't. Um before we get into the content of the prayer itself, do you think we need to reintroduce this as a central reoccurring uh recited part of our formation? Yeah, you you know, because we are a people of the book. A few weeks ago, I preached a message called Shaped by Scripture. 
And, and so we are a people that are shaped by scripture. Uh, one of the things that we do at our church is we always read from the Psalms. We close every service with the blessings of number 624. And so scripture is always heavily present in our church. And so to my Anglican friends, I'm like, no, we have liturgy. It's just different than yours. But but we have liturgy and every Sunday, Jesus and all that he's worth is lifted up and exalted on high. But I do think there is power in praying scripture. There is power in saying the Lord's prayer. Um, I think as Protestants, I think as evangelicals, we react so hard to what we'll see in the Orthodox church, what we'll see in the Catholic church is dry and dead and sterile. Well, the word of God is not dry, dead and sterile. It's that we are dry, dead and sterile. And so there has to be an intentionality to the spirit's power to draw us to the father through the son. And when you look at the Lord's prayer, right? We have to over communicate. One, one of the things that Brene Brown says is clear is kind, unclear is unkind. And so it's unkind just to throw up the Lord's prayer without giving a clarity of what it means. And what I do throughout the book is I first and foremost introduce people to the Lord's prayer and that it is a micro teaching of the very life of Jesus. Yeah, you call it a, a mini catechism in the book. A mini catechism. Yeah, like it is a mini teaching on the life of Christ. Like, think about, about this. Um, Jesus and the Father had a beautiful love relationship. Jesus honored the Father's name as holy. That meant his allegiance was to him. Jesus embodied the kingdom of God. And I want to take a moment here because that can be very uh, um, elusive. Well, what is the kingdom of God? This is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is Jesus at 12 years old going to the temple, dumbfounding uh, older folks. The kingdom of God is Jesus rebuking Peter. The kingdom of God is Jesus forgiving Zacchaeus. The kingdom of God is Jesus calling Matthew. The kingdom of God is Jesus going to a Samaritan woman. The kingdom of God is Jesus overturning tables at the temple because it had turned into a den of thieves instead of a house of prayer for all ethnos. And and Sky, you and I, you, we are passionate about the multi-ethnic church. It's not a fad. It is the eternal purpose of God realized in Christ Jesus. It is the manifold wisdom, right? And so when you look at the kingdom of God, it's Jesus. Jesus is the bread of life. He's the substance of life. He's not like batteries included, man. He is life, right? And then Jesus is the new Passover. He is forgiveness. He is redemption. He's the one who lives in us through the spirit to make us a living temple so that we can forgive as we have been forgiven, walking in the power of the blood, which means healing is available. Ultimate healing is in the resurrection. But as the Christian Missionary Alliance says, Jesus is a healer now. He can heal now. But then when you look at lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is speaking of when Jesus in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, goes into the wilderness. He's retracing the, ste the steps of Israel. And where Israel and Adam fails, Jesus wins because he says, no, Scripture says, man might not live by bread alone, but by every word out of God's mouth. Jesus defeats Satan for us in the wilderness. Then through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus defeats the powers of darkness. It doesn't mean bad things are not going to happen, but it means a good God is waging battle for us that we have already won. And so clear is kind. The Lord's Prayer is about Jesus. And then secondly, the Lord's Prayer is the prayer that God always answers because that's God's will for your life. And God's will for our life is portable. And this is what I mean. If you're an airplane pilot, the Lord's prayer conforms you to the image of Christ and you glorify him flying a plane. If you teach English, if you're a professional wrestler, professional football player, stay at home, dad or mom, whatever it is, if you're Derwin Gray or Sky Jatani, which is a very cool name, the Lord's prayer is extra cool on your name, is the Lord's prayer is forming us into the people of God that reflects the son of God to join him on his ministry and mission. What we're looking for, Sky, what we're looking for is the joy that can only come from God forging us and forming us into his son. Amen. 
uh, you're, you're kind of unpacking what I love about your book and your approach to the Lord's Prayer. I think some people mistakenly take the Lord's Prayer and they maybe they do recite it every week in their liturgy at their church or they use it regularly in their own time of prayer, but they just they just say the words mm-hmm. and they treat it almost like an incantation. Like if I just mm-hmm. say these magic words, God will hear me and bless me or respond to me in some way. But what you're showing is I think what Jesus intended, which is that every line of the Lord's Prayer opens a window onto a far larger vista, right? A, a bigger vision of who God is, a better mm-hmm. understanding of who Jesus is, a clearer picture of who we're called to be mm-hmm. with him and in his kingdom. And and so to take the Lord's Prayer and thoughtfully just say one line of it and then pause and reflect yes. on what I need from God yes. in that. And what, like, that's how it's to be used as a guide yes. in our communion with him, not just a, a bunch of words we recite like a magic spell. And that's what you're unpacking as you went yeah. through it just now, all these different pieces to it. And it, it goes endlessly deep in, I mean, the book is like 300 pages, but you probably could have written a thousand because there's so many facets to this. Yeah, you, you know, so uh, I got introduced to the Lord's Prayer when I was an NFL player with the Indianapolis Colts. So right before the game, uh, we go in the locker room and then guys would go into the shower and a Catholic priest and then the Protestant chaplain would lead us all in the Lord's Prayer. And so I would say the Lord's Prayer and had no clue, number one, of obeying it. Number two, even what it meant. But number three, it was like, okay, this is going to go help me play a good game. Mm. And so what what we've done, even for Christians, is is we've turned prayer into like an ATM code. Like if like prayer's the credit card, and then I press a code, and then out comes the blessing that I want. And what God wants to do is reverse that from consumption to participation. The Lord's Prayer is an invitation into God's story of redemption. He wants to be your father. And so what I do is I unpack who is our father, right? And so we look at all of these incredible aspects of God's nature and God's character. Like it's hard to pray to someone that you don't trust. And what Jesus wants us to do is say, my father is trustworthy. Your messed up circumstances, my messed up circumstances does not put his trustworthiness on trial because the verdict of his trustworthiness was shown to be true when Jesus died and rose again. And when the spirit came, that when Jesus walked out of that tomb, he led a whole new race of people called the resurrection. And we become a sign and foretaste to the future. Future and if I could pause here, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna get on my soapbox just for a minute, and I'm gonna jump off. Um, we have to do a better job of teaching the story of God. Um, Jesus did not just save us through His blood and resurrection so that we can escape this ugly earth one day. No, the Lord's prayer: Do on earth as it is in heaven. We're so busy trying to escape earth, and Jesus was busy trying to bring heaven to earth. And when you look at the end of the book, the book of Revelation, there's a new Jerusalem, a new heavens, new earth descending. God isn't going to destroy this earth. He's going to renew this earth and it's going to have renewed people. So until that uh, 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 project comes into being, it's like we become waiters and we're giving appetizers of the true meal. One of my favorite restaurants is Papa Do's Seafood Kitchen. (laughs) <laughs> I'm, my my sky one of these days we have to go my main meal is blackened catfish opelousas it has 8 million 419 calories in it but it's worth it i but love before, blackened catfish yes before i eat it though i get the oysters papa dough and that appetizer prepares me for what's to come well the lord's prayer forms us into the image of christ in our lives And the things that we do in partnership with God becomes an appetizer to the main meal, the lamb supper, where there's room enough for everybody at his table and he doesn't run out of food. So we don't have to have a scarcity mentality. We can have a generous mentality. And the beauty is what's going to happen in eternity. We can give a foretaste of it in the present. So the Lord's prayer is not an escape plan. It's a rescue plan. Okay, don't get off your soapbox quite yet because okay. uh, you know there's a lengthy section of your book which is all about the kingdom, 
and as you've mentioned, you know, God's will on earth as it is in heaven and our role in that kingdom and our, and our participation in it. Uh, you talk about our, our identity as royal priests. And there's a section in here <laughs> where you talk about what does it mean for us to actually manifest that kingdom or to, to bring that foretaste of the kingdom to our world. And you, you kind of root it in our call to love our neighbor as ourselves. Yeah. And then you expand from Leviticus 19, where that command is originally given, and you you define what does it mean to love our neighbor. And yeah. a couple of the points you make are loving our neighbor means living with integrity. It means pursuing economic justice. It mm -hmm. means caring for those with disabilities. It means seeking an equitable justice system. Mm -hmm. And then living with grace, compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. Now, yes. all that's rooted in Leviticus 19. Yes. You realize you're going to upset some people. When you say Good. things like our call is economic justice and an equitable justice system, I mean, those are things that a lot of people in the contemporary American church go like, oh, no, 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 that's not God's kingdom. That's all politics. And that's 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 social issues. And that has nothing to do with what Jesus talked about. So yeah. get back on that soapbox and tell me yeah. why these are critical to the kingdom of God. Yeah. You know, um, so one of the things that's important for us is we have to read Jesus's words in Jesus's culture for what Jesus meant. Unfortunately, in a lot of modern Western Christianity in America, we have taken Jesus's words and we have overlaid them in progressive liberal politics, or we have overlaid them in conservative Republican politics. And Jesus is not a donkey. And Jesus is not an elephant. Jesus is a lamb. And the message of Jesus is supremely political, but not in the sense that we think. When Jesus said, or when Jesus followers said, Jesus is Lord, that was very political because they were saying that Caesar may think he's Lord. Caesar may think he has power, but the kingdom of God is greater. And what I mean by that is this, is the politics of Jesus transcends these petty politics of America. Now, do I vote? Heck yeah, I vote. I'm a black man. Uh, my people were lynched, burned, churches bombed, dogs set on them so I can vote. And I vote, but I understand it's a secondary order. The primary order is the kingdom of God. And can the kingdom of God work through elephants and donkeys? Yes. But what we've done, though, is we have trumped the kingdom of God with the kingdom of man. And so as believers, uh, we should work for economic justice. Like, why wouldn't we? Like, think of Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 6, the Hellenistic Greek widows were not being taken care of. The Hebraic Greek widows were having more economic uh, favoritism than they were. So what did they do? They let the apostles know, and the apostles did not do affirmative action, but they affirmed the right action, and they put seven Hellenistic Greek men in charge of the daily distribution of food. So we as the church should have... Um, food opportunities. So at, here at Transformation Church, we have what's called the Hope Dealers Market, where our church gives funds. And several times a week, there are a line of cars around our church shopping in our grocery store for free. Over the years, we've prepared over 200,000 backpack meals for kids in public schools because we found out 11 years ago that there are kids who go home every weekend who don't have enough food to eat. And we said, not on our watch. We also need doctors and lawyers and dentists to develop free health care and clinics. And we also need lawyers and businessmen to say, hey, how can we tilt the playing field? Because it's one thing to help people, but it's another thing to change laws that are unjust that keep people poor. Those are gospel issues. If that's not a gospel issue, Jesus should have just told the people who listen to him preach all day, hey, I know you guys are hungry, but go pull yourself up by your bootstraps. No, what he did is he took the Happy Meal from a little boy and multiplied it. And here's so, so, something else that's pretty cool, Sky, is Jesus did two miracles around the Sea of Galilee. 
one on the Gentile side and one on the Jewish side to give a foretaste of how Jews and Gentiles are the people of God. Jesus wants to feed everybody. And it's ironic, the only people that are going to get mad at me talking about economic injustice are people who profit from an unjust system. Ouch. And so for we as the people of God, right? I grew up poor. I grew up in the hood, poor by American standards. But what good is my life if I'm not using it to bless other people? You know, years ago, like eight, nine years ago, I I said, why is it that Walmart and Amazon, why can't they pay for college for people who work at their stores? Well, they're doing that now. You know why? Because the workers said, we're not coming back to work. And, you know, for the Waltons, they have four of the richest uh, uh, people in America. Like, man, paying for college for people, that's a good thing to do. How much more do we need? And so generosity is important. But then what the progressives do is they think that utopia can come in. What the conservatives do is, well, we just need to go to heaven when we die. And I think Jesus is saying, no, we cannot usher in utopia, but we certainly can give glimpses of what the kingdom is. Um, I heard this years ago from a believer in another country, and he said, um, you know, it's hard to share the gospel with people when their stomachs are grumbling and they can't hear. You feed them physical bread and spiritual bread. Uh, recently, Christine Kane came and preached at our church, and she goes, I don't understand Americans. She goes, for me, evangelism, discipleship, and justice are all the same. There is no bifurcation or trifurcation. And I think we see that in Jesus. Jesus invited people into the kingdom of God. Not only did he forgive sins, but he healed broken bodies. I've heard that same comment from people overseas who don't understand the American church and our bifurcation of these of these issues. So the fact that you are teaching your church and through this book teaching all of us the unity that these things have within the kingdom of God is really, really important. It's something we need healed in our American imagination around these things. Okay, finally, before we wrap up, one of the reoccurring themes in, in your writing, and certainly in this book, and regarding the Lord's Prayer is you talk about how this prayer isn't a means to some other end. It's not how you achieve something in the world or how you get something. And you you talk about how Christ himself is the treasure. Yeah. Christ himself is the goal. Yeah. Um, talk about when did that awareness break through for you? In your yeah. development as a, as a younger Christian, when did you come to the place of realizing, oh, wait a minute, this this gospel and this life with God isn't just about cleaning up my life or being more um, healthy or having better relationships. There's something even richer beyond all this. When did that break through for you? Yeah. You, you know, um, in, in God's sovereignty, it happened through my marriage. Um, my wife and I got married in college. We've been together since I was 18. She was 19. May 23rd will be 30 years of marriage, which is a miracle. The first wedding I went to was my own. So we became followers of Jesus five years into marriage. But at year 10 is when it began to click is for the first 10 years of my marriage, I wanted to be with my wife because I could get something from her. You know, maybe she could meet an emotional need. Maybe she could meet a physical need. You know, uh, she's smarter than me. Like she's awesome. But then as I began to learn what it meant to really have a marriage, that it's not about taking, it's about giving, it's about being, it hit me that when my wife went through cancer in 2004, and she's cancer-free now, um, it wasn't about what I could get from her. It hit me that it's simply about being with her. Like, I just, I just want to be with her for who she is. And that's where I sense the Lord saying, hey, uh, you're my bride. I didn't go to a jewelry store to buy a ring. I went to the Jerusalem garbage dump and I got on a cross. My proposal was in blood. And when I walked out of that tomb, I said, will you hold my hand and say, I do. And it hit, hit, it hit me that God wants to be with us and he wants us to want to simply be with him. And one of the illustrations that I use in the book is like Thanksgiving is 
is happening. It's like being at your mom's house and your grandma's house and you go in, everybody's eating the food and your your mom or your grandma or granddad is at the front of the table. No one's talking to them. No one's asking them how they're doing. It's like pasta gravy and turkeys everywhere and it's all good. And then it's like, when is the apple pie going to come and you eat your apple pie and then you get up and you look at your grandparent and go, hey, um, I'll see you next year. The food was great. Bye. And I think that's the way we approach Jesus is we come, we come to his banquet table and we go, give me more gravy, give me more stuffing. And Jesus is looking at us and tears are rolling down his face. And he's, and he's saying, oh, precious child, I've got something so much more than gravy and turkey. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of God's mouth. And God is saying, I want to speak to you. And, and, and so prayer is not about getting Prayer is about being with God. And when we are with God, God begins to transform us through his presence. And we come to this holy longing to go, God, if you only give me yourself, that's enough because you are my enough. Amen. Amen. Derwin, thank you for your leadership and your teaching. Thank you for this book. I can't recommend it enough. I, I joked with you earlier that books about prayer don't sell. I mean, there just isn't as much demand for them. I know this from experience, but um, it doesn't surprise me that these are the messages, this is the content that is so transformative that we need right now, that the church needs right now, that, yeah, we are wealthy and we are prosperous as Americans and as American Christians, but I think it's just, it's masking how deeply impoverished we really are. And I think your, your book reveals the treasure that's available to us if we would just slow down enough and and pay attention. So please, everyone go check it out. Um, God, do you hear me all about the Lord's prayer? Um, it'll transform the way you, not only you think about prayer, but your understanding of your own life with God. So Derwin, God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And also Lifeway is selling it at a 50% discount. So buy a ton of them for family and friends. All right. We'll put the link in the show notes. And one last thing, Derwin and I are both going to be at the Right Now Conference in, uh, I think it's in Dallas, right? In early November? Yes. And we're going to Papa Do's, bro. <laughs> okay. I, I'm treat. there for the for the catfish. I don't know if I can do the oysters. Okay. But we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Thanks, Derwin. Thank you, brother. Okay. Bye-bye. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Phil Vischer Enterprises, that's Phil's company, and Sky Pilot Media, that's Sky's company. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, and more.